Where do you figure it's from? I don't know, Mr. Scott. Well, from this planet? I doubt it. Well, do you... The answers will be much easier after we've examined the interior of the aircraft and its occupants, if there are any. Occupants? I never... What a story! Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. We are at episode 9, which is Erica's choice. Erica, what do you have for us this time? I have the excellent 1951's The Thing from Another World, starring Kenneth Toby, Margaret Sheridan, Douglas Spencer, and Robert Cornthwaite. Oh, and also James Arness as The Thing. And it is directed by Christian Nivey, produced by Howard Hawks, screenplay by Charles Lederer, which is also based on the source novel of Who Goes There? from 1938. Now, it says directed by Christian Nyby. It does. And there's a little bit of debate about that. And in reading on it, a lot of the actors spoke about the situation as well. And Howard Hawks was kind of cagey about it. Christian Nyby also mentioned that he felt that Howard Hawks was very much his mentor and an undisputably amazing artist. And so he felt that he wanted to get his input. He wanted to stick with that amazing Howard Hawks style, but he very much directed the piece. I think there's definitely the unmistakable Howard Hawks stamp on this film. You can feel it in so many aspects of the movie, particularly the overlapping dialogue, which was something that was quite new to me when I first saw this and started to recognize it across all of those films and so excited to see it here. And then the very specific punchy script and the the heightening of tension mm -hmm. as well. So there's no superfluous moments in this oh, for no. me. Absolutely not. So why did you choose this one for the show? I chose this because I wanted to talk in general about the atomic age genre of science fiction and horror movies. It's hands down for me one of my absolute favorite genres, and I try to catch them whenever I can. But this film for me, The Thing from Another World, is the highlight of that genre. And I think it speaks to so many aspects, so many running themes that you see throughout the genre. And I chose this one because it's the one that I never, ever, ever get tired of watching. I will watch them 20 times. I will watch The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms and Quatermass and so on and so forth, a lot of which I'll be mentioning. But the thing is the one I return to so often. And because it does bridge the sci-fi and horror genres, you can watch it all year long if you want to. And would you have chosen this one for one of your choices? If we were going to go with Atomic Age sci-fi, I might have gone with something less paranoia-based. Mm -hmm. To me, that's later period Cold War. I might have gone with something more of the science run amok genre. You mentioned them. Mm -hmm. I love that one. It's a great one. Anything with mutated creatures yes. and science gone completely awry, I might have ventured more in that direction to find a more prime example of atomic era science fiction. Because to me, the paranoia aspects that make the thing from another world so interesting are much more post-atomic almost than actual atomic era. Do you consider yourself a fan of this one? Oh, I love it. Okay. I'm a huge fan of it for all sorts of reasons, which we will get into in greater detail. Well, this one for me also hits a number of my kind of pet favorite topics. One is polar exploration. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge nerd for that. So it maybe started all the way back when I saw this when I was probably about 10 years old. That's about the same time I saw it, too. And this one was introduced to me by my mom, as so many of these things were as well. And I also am a lover of process, so I really like to know how things work and how people make them work. And this movie is all about process and problem solving, and it's go, 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 and I love that. Mm -hmm. 
A couple more things in the laundry list of things I like about this movie. One being the ensemble cast with a very much lived in camaraderie. It really feels like they've been with each other for years as the movie would suggest. And I had mentioned the script a few moments ago, and it really never feels dumbed down or really overly fantastical, even though we're talking about a creature from another planet. And I really enjoy that it sticks to a science base, at least as they understood it then. The teamwork and camaraderie was one of the things I put in my notes also that really appeals to me. It's all about action, like you said. There is no doubt, there's no hesitation in any of their actions. It is, this is the problem that faces us, let's make the plan, let's put the plan into action. There aren't those characters that would become stock later that melt down, that aren't able to process or handle the threat that's in front of them. Thankfully, there is no hand-wringing, hysterical woman in this. No, not at all. Everyone in this thing, with the exception of Barnes for just a little bit (laughs) when he puts the electric blanket on the block of ice that releases the creature, are are wholly competent, which is what I love about it. It's a real blue-collar pragmatist approach to science fiction monsters. Utter competence, problem-solving all the way down the line, like you said. And my favorite character is Bob, who is Mr. Idea Man. Love that guy. Whatever needs to get done, get it done. And that leads me to a brief synopsis of the film. We have got a U.S. Air Force crew that's in Alaska, and they are called up to a North Pole research station by Dr. Carrington, who is the head of the lab there, to investigate some sort of strange phenomenon. There was something in the sky, and it landed. And so they go out to the landing site and discover a man from Mars in a spacecraft. The way I like about how they present this, even before we're aware of that, it starts so small with little innocuous things that are foreshadowing what's going to come. You have little details like instruments not quite working properly. Not enough to cause alarm, It might be something just off enough that a little tap on the dial might fix it initially, but all of this is pointing subtly to the much larger problem to come. And after they find this creature trapped in the ice, they excavate him from the ice, bring him back to the research station, which leads to uh, good old Barnes throwing the electric blanket on him and melting him and then bringing him to life. And then he begins to terrorize the station. And then we begin a central question, which is, what has caused this? How do we fight this? And what is the reasonable course for overall protection, for public safety, for the furthering of science and understanding? And science is actually the antagonist in this case. The opposition side is science for science's sake, not profit. Though you could certainly extrapolate that out, thinking about the further impact upon the military-industrial complex that this sort of discovery might have. But at least at this point in the film, the antagonist, Carrington, his motivation is utterly pure, I feel like. He just wants to learn everything that he can from this creature. Right. It's all about discovery. It's all about potentially even being a bridge between two worlds. Yes. For him. There is nothing, say, to compare to... Burke, Paul Reiser's character in Aliens, whose motivation was purely corporate, purely profit, purely a position of advantage. Absolutely. And everyone could be sacrificed within that motivation. Right. Whereas Carrington's motivation in this is purely knowledge-based. This wariness of science is a great example of where public sentiment was in the atomic age at this point. And let's step back for a second and talk about the atomic age itself. So we all know there was the Trinity test site, the atom bomb testing in 1945, July 1945. And then, of course, the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan in August 1945. And from that moment, actually from 1948 to 1962, Hollywood released more than 500 science fiction and horror films with these atomic issues as a central theme. So clearly there was a lot to talk about. Really that science was the creator of this horror unleashed upon the world 
but also it's salvation at the same time. And I think you can see that same conflict within this film because you have different factions within the scientific community as represented at this research station. You've got some of the scientists who are arguing that we cannot save this creature, we must fight it because we have no idea of the bacteria that it could be carrying that could be detrimental to our health. That as they start to understand a little bit more about what the creature is doing, which is multiplying itself, it could be creating an army that we would have to eventually fight. And then you have Dr. Carrington and some of his fellow scientists saying, no, we must learn. We must do this. This creature is greater than us. It has the capacity for more knowledge and understanding than we do, and we have to tap into it. It makes me think of a particular H.P. Lovecraft quote that I always liked that, this is a paraphrase, obviously, but the oldest emotion mankind knows is fear. Yes. And the oldest fear is fear of the unknown. Yes. But the thing is, in this film... You don't see that from a lot of these characters. The great majority of them, in fact. The fear of the unknown. Fear, period. Fear is not what motivates the Air Force corpsman. I feel like their issue is, a, is much more an issue of this is a practical problem that we need to deal with right now. This is an immediate threat. There's no fear, though. It is just problem solving, like mm. you said. But in even more direct opposition to that idea, you have Carrington, who at one point says... There are no enemies in science. And that idea in 2015 is a wholly admirable idea to me. But in 1951, still under the large looming shadow of the end of World War II, after having witnessed the immense, unprecedented, destructive power of what science had just unleashed, it might have been a lot easier for the average citizen to perceive science as an enemy if only for the reason that the thing that they created has such incredible potential to grow out of their control. Yes, and frequently does in these movies, really. And it makes me think that essentially science gets entirely co-opted, whether it's by the government and the military, or you mentioned aliens before, by the industrial military complex. Dr. Carrington is striving for science for science sake everyone else is trying to use science to kill or harm or to save but again i understand that all of these motives can be suspect within that when you don't really know who to trust whose motivation is pure science continually has these strange bedfellows in all of these movies including this one so it is i think a subject rightly of paranoia but what do you think then that everyone was in fact afraid of, anyone watching this movie? You had mentioned that an experiment can completely get out of control. It has huge destructive tendencies. So what is the unknown fear? I don't think it's an unknown fear, actually, what people are afraid of in this time and place. I think it is a very known quantity, and I think it is quite literally our complete destruction. So it seems totally reasonable that these movies have lasted so long because they are talking about nothing less than our complete destruction. Right. What Total is greater to talk annihilation. about? There is no greater fear than our extinction. And I think also why the genre mutated as the decades have gone on, because I remember being a kid in the 70s and 80s and being very aware of the concept of the button this red button that would <laughs> that would end in our again in our total destruction so you have this idea that lasts and lasts and lasts and keeps generating all of this new art right well we're the last generation i would say probably of cold war kids and so we saw the very end of that i don't know if the generation after us my sister for instance feels that as acutely as we I do i don't think they did yeah I think it was for us. Well, each generation has its own thing that it's afraid of. Horror as a genre has always reflected what we as a culture at large are collectively afraid of. And there are tons of examples from the 30s through present day. If you look at the first universal monster cycle in the early 30s, obviously xenophobia and particularly fear of the unknown and exotic parts of Europe mm -hmm. to us. Especially the Eastern European monsters in the old world and the vaguely teutonic ones mm -hmm. in the 50s obviously you have science like we're talking about with this particular episode 
Do you remember when, in your childhood, you became specifically aware of the phenomenon of serial killers? Yes. Do you remember what time frame that, I do. that you became aware of that? I do. I remember specifically because of Ted Bundy. Right. So we're talking very early 80s. For me, when I first heard of Ted Bundy, he had been operating before that, but... Right. Yes. And so as a culture, that idea crept into our public consciousness in the late 80s, yes. probably maybe even early 90s. And so what do you see around that time? You see Silence of the Lambs, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, films like that. I also remember from that early 80s period playing a uh, hijacker with my friends and we would pretend like we were terrorists because that was reflected constantly the in the news. Uh, and up until the early 2000s, when you have the Bush administration and we are involved in the Gulf War and you have these films like Hostel and Teristas, which very clearly demonstrate our anxiety about how we as Americans are perceived abroad. So you see that shift from America as the dominant force to Americans as threatened in other places. And now, where we find ourselves in 2015, it is a perfect storm of horror, it seems like, because all of those things I mentioned, there's the xenophobia that I mentioned from the films in the 30s. There's the distinctly anti-intellectualism feeling that comes from this film and the other films of its ilk in the 50s. That fear of the stranger next door is going to be the person that could potentially wear your skin (laughs) And our place as an actor on the world stage, every single one of those things seems to be currently prominently featured on every newscast or in every feed on any social media platform that I look at, at least. So I'm exceedingly curious to see down the road, when we look back at this point in time, how they shoehorn all of those elements instead of just the one that we found in each decade before how they shoehorn everything to be afraid of into the horror of 2015. And if we do look back again to 1951 when this film came out, this was one year after McCarthy stood up and said, there are communists infiltrating our military and our government. And it's no accident that this film is at the North Pole in Alaska, close to Russia, And it's no accident that the film ends with the ominous warning to keep watching the skies, ostensibly for communists, for the people infiltrating our country. So with that overt warning at the end of the film, the filmmakers, and I think most people would say probably Howard Hawks' influence here is saying that this enemy is at the borders, or within the country already. And we need to be aware of this. We need to start mobilizing for it. So it's essentially propaganda at this point as well. And I think a lot of people bought into it, clearly. Oh, without a doubt. So if our art is ostensibly reflecting what Americans are fearing, the Soviets, what did the Soviets see reflected in their art? Well, if you look at the two specific elements of this film, the horror element and the science fiction element. The Soviet film industry didn't produce horror films, essentially. Wow. The Soviet film industry, from the sound era until the mid-80s, until Perestroika and Glasnost and all of that occurred, produced only one or two significant horror films, period. Really? What were they like? They were primarily folktale-based. Because in Marxism, there's essentially no room for horror. (laughs) There are things that don't occur to you to be afraid of. Think about what an individual experience horror is. You're not thinking of a collective when you are fearing for your life. Yes. And these little things that we take for granted when we watch a film were completely foreign concepts to them. So much of horror is about invasion of your personal space. Mm -hmm. If you don't have personal space... You cannot relate. Yes. You don't even think of this to create You're that part art. of the collective. Your possessions right. are part of that. It's all towards this greater concept. Sure. So true terror, fear for your own safety, doesn't reflect the party values. Fearing for yourself is not devotion to the glorious cause, mm-hmm. basically. It's true. I have a hard time picturing an effective way to demonstrate in a horror film that the protagonist is terrified for the future of the party. Because of this interloper. (laughs) So it just didn't happen. Science fiction, on the other hand, flourished 
in the Soviet era, but it was a lot different from what we see in this film. In Soviet film, and literature for that matter, in science fiction, scientists were idealized, were held up as heroes, admirable. There was none of this fear of what they were creating because their scientists had not created doomsday devices. Absolutely. There was no shift like we had. Right. So from, let's say, the mid-50s, maybe the early 50s, until 1968, when you have the invasion of Czechoslovakia, through that whole period, you have this party implemented still, but legitimate feeling among the citizenry there of pride and hopefulness and accomplishment. And you don't have the conflicted and painful history with science that, say, the United States or Japan had. They were insular, but filled with hope about the potential things that science could create. So essentially, they very simply did not have the same fears and anxieties that American audiences did. And by the time we came around, these anxieties were just sort of echoes for us that we picked up via Saturday afternoon matinees on television. This stuff never screened in theaters in our lifetime. No. And you have the opportunity now to see sort of the big examples. But all of these small ones, I remember them being read more readily available on TV when I was a kid. So that's how I found them. And I think, and I remember back to my favorite character when I was very small was the Incredible Hulk. Again, the effects of science. And so I start to think about making these connections from these things I loved and then these other discoveries that I found and where they took me. And I wanted to just do a, a bit of a survey, I guess, of the atomic age in general with some of the highlights for me and hopefully for you, too. And lowlights. And lowlights. So speaking of, I think of the categories as being the bad, the good, and the great within the atomic age. Okay, so and where do we start? I'm going to start with the bad first, because... The bad, as possibly epitomized by your Burt I. Gordons and your <laughs> Sam Katzmans. And those things led me directly to Mystery Science Theater 3000. And I, I love to watch those things now, and I love to see where they take me in these different directions, even today. And I love thinking back to discovering that whenever you see the logo for American International, you know you're going to have something great. Great. The great bad. The great slash bad. Right. And I think the transition piece from that bad is that line of your William Castle pictures. Okay. Those great drive-in films. And I have a distinct memory as a very young person of seeing the bloodied hand come out of the bathtub in the color scene in The Tingler. And that was my first introduction. And that was a great place to go for. And it's never, never let me down. So what is the line of demarcation exactly between the bad and the good? Is it thematic? Is it the technical skill with which the film is made? Where? How do you break those down. I would have to say probably quality and intention, but I really think that Bert I. Gordon set out to make a masterpiece every time. <laughs> probably uh, but, so. you know, he didn't quite have the money to maybe realize it or didn't quite have the taste. I think that's uh, more the case. A little bit of that. And that leads us into the good. Firmly in the good category, for me at least, is anything involving a sea creature because I'm obsessed with the water. And I love the idea of all of these things existing down there. So I, the beast from 20,000 Fathoms falls firmly in the good Definitely. Category. And I didn't really think about what put the beast down there, what unleashed the beast, the whole testing possibility. Mm -hmm. It was just these super cool creatures. And then, for me, that leads directly into the great, which would be anything involving Ray Harryhausen. So Harryhausen's work in Beast from 20,000 Fathoms is edging up to great, and everything beyond that falls firmly in. All of these categories can sometimes meld into each other. The, <laughs> the, the walls are permeable. How that's, about that? That's why I asked initially, <laughs> because it seems like on any given day, depending on how you feel when you wake up, you could throw all these categories in a bag and shake them vigorously and then... They'll let the chips fall where they may. That's true. And I still want to watch any of them on any given day, too. So, meh. 
That's because to me, the thing that sets the great ones apart are theme and execution. Mm-hmm. And obviously some are made with a considerably larger budget, with considerably better actors. And those are the ones that I think vault into the great category. So, for example, when you have something like The Day the Earth Stood Still, where you have excellent actors, they had a bit of more of a budget, and they clearly took time on the script. Right. It wasn't some American international thing that was knocked out in 12 days. I don't know why you say that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> well, it's, no, it's true. It's not. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. I like them almost as much as you do, probably. But yes, there is a distinct difference in presentation between those two things. Well, I'm going to mention one which I know is one of your favorites, and I actually had not seen the original until you showed it to me, which is, and I'm going to use the Japanese title of Gojira. Mm. So we're talking about Godzilla, a film made in Japan. They acquired the rights in the U.S. and then reworked it to include Raymond Burr. But if you see the original, you will understand how excellent it is and how head and shoulders it is above the American version. Obviously, no nation has a more complicated and painful history with the atomic era than Japan. Mm -hmm. And if anyone is going to make the definitive film about the king of atomic monsters, it is going to be them. Yes, Godzilla remains an absolute favorite to this day. And you should absolutely watch the Japanese version rather than the American version without the distraction of any marquee names where all you have is Japanese society dealing with this atomic genie that's been let out of the bottle. And it's a symphony, I think, of sound and dread and pacing. Yeah, it's fantastic. So we mentioned Japan and the U.S. and the Soviet Union, the most prominent players either in the conclusion of World War II or the Cold War, Outside of those examples, what else would you mention of note beyond the borders of those countries? I've got one specific example from the UK, which is Fiend Without a Face. And you introduced me to this, which is why I love talking about making connections because you never know what you're going to find. And that's a great one, representing making something really great and terrifying without a lot of pieces or again of the marquee names or a big budget and also from england we've got the amazing hammer studios which have made some of my very favorite films and also had some entries in this atomic Uh, age oh no what stop um okay why because you're about to uh, steal my recommendation oh no how was i gonna do that with hammer yes okay So, So, portion of our show when we get to our recommendations. Perfect. Great. So, what is it? Great segue. Thanks. (laughs) My recommendation (laughs) for further viewing this time is Quatermass and the Pit. I was just about to mention it. From 1967. I know you were. That's why I stopped you. So good. Directed by Roy Ward Baker, starring Andrew Keir, James Donald, Barbara Shelley, and Julian Glover. It has a lot of parallels to The Thing from Another World in the sense that the movie begins with them unearthing an object in the London underground. It turns out that it is an alien craft. They remove husks of bodies from the craft. They're super creepy. And these dormant aliens begin to exert a sinister psychic influence that spreads throughout the city. It's one of my all-time favorites from this time period. If I can also give a recommendation on your recommendation, it's uh, check out the Quatermass Experiment, which you helped me find. Mm. I had this memory of, I remember this, and this guy was doing this, and what do you think that is? And you figured it out right away. And it all comes from a series of BBC radio plays, which you can also track down and listen to. They're fantastic as well. But for the purpose of the Atomic Age Monster episode... yes. Quater Mass in the Pit. Well, oddly enough, my recommendation also has a London connection, and it is The Giant Behemoth from 1959. I and knew you were going to pick that one. Because you know I love it so much, and you got it for me as a present one year instead of my VHS copy of it forever. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. Again, I love anything involving a sea creature, but this one especially because it's got a great tone and great music, and... It's lovely in black and white, and there's nothing too bombastic about it. I like it that it's more of a quiet... Aside from a giant behemoth? Aside from that guy. 
it it's got an american scientist who is trying to bring everybody's attention to the fact that we're polluting our oceans with these atomic tests so 1959 we're several years removed from all of that but he's finding all of these dead fish everywhere and talking about high levels of atomic radiation in these fish and so we've got to alert the world to this and he gets a lot of pushback from it until the behemoth appears and is irradiating the oceans around Cornwall so it's got the London connection because the giant behemoth shows up in the Thames and that's where they have to fight it it's pretty awesome so my recommendation 1959's the giant behemoth featuring gene evans and one of my all-time favorites andre morell who's actually a brit and you'll see him in lots and lots and lots of movies okay two great atomic age yeah creatures which brings us to the end of another episode We have a little more housekeeping than usual to do right here at this section because I wanted to take a second and say individual thank yous to everyone who has been kind enough to leave reviews for the show. Mike Scharf, Dan Grissom, and John Merrill all left really thoughtful reviews. Thank you very much for that. I also wanted to mention members of the podcast community that have been super supportive to us so far. Stephen Presley was nice enough to leave us a very kind review, and he has just launched his own podcast, Thunder Pop, which Erica appeared on last week talking about one of our favorite subjects, Mystery Science Theater 3000. I was great on it. (laughs) Hugh Gallen from Hungry Dads left us a great review. Hugh does a fantastic show in which they elevate the conversation about snack foods to an entirely new level. It's very entertaining. And Aaron West, whom I mentioned before from Criterion Close-Up that he does with Mark Herney, he also left us a really great review. We appreciate all of that. I also wanted to say thanks to the guys from Cinema Court that had me on to discuss Friday the 13th. And I wanted to mention specifically Jeff Duncanson, who reached out to us on Twitter and gave us a really great compliment, saying that when he listened to the No Country for Old Men show As he was driving home, he immediately wanted to go in and put the movie on. That is exactly the kind of response that we hope to inspire in people. And he also mentioned that he would really like to see us do Aguirre, The Wrath of God by Werner Herzog. Great choice. I guarantee we will be doing Herzog because he is a huge favorite of both of ours. So that will be coming sometime down the line. And if you would like to join the illustrious ranks of these folks whose name we mention with gratitude, you can find us on iTunes and rate and review the show there. One click gets you subscribed to the show, and every other Monday we will show up in your feed with no further effort necessary on your part. We're also on Stitcher Radio. If you'd like to email us, you can reach us at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We're on Facebook. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast and we're easy to find. We're on Twitter at Lantern underscore cast. And we're on the web at MagicLanternPodcast.com where you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material in the show notes, which in this case will include links to the Cinema Court and Thunder Pop episodes that we appeared on in the last couple of weeks. Basically, we are everywhere on the internet. You can find us just about anywhere. And we would love it if you would get in touch with us. Let us know what you think of the show. If you have questions or comments or would just like to send us presents. Yeah, or book us for personal appearances. We'll be happy to do any and all of those things. Thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 